reverence them all for who you are. We thank you for what you have provided for us and given to us in your Son. Thank you for the free gift that you have given to us, free to us, but it cost you everything. And Lord, we are a grateful people today for that gift. And Lord, our desire today is that the Son of the living God would be high and lifted up in our midst. He would be high and lifted up in our lives, oh God. That He would be high and lifted up in this place. And that He would be high and lifted up in the earth, oh God. Where you said in your word, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. May He be lifted up today in the midst of His people, oh God. Oh, hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we commit the rest of this service into your hands, oh God. Lord, we ask for the anointing over your word, Lord. Over this teaching, over this preaching, Lord God. Lord, that you would quicken our hearts, quicken our minds, quicken our spirits. Lord, that you would grant unto us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Son of the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we'll thank you for it today, giving you praise and honor and glory. We say it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you love them today? presence of God in this house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to say what an honor it is for me to be with you and be able to worship with you. Uh, I always count it a privilege to be able to uh, intermingle with the body of Christ. I travel all over the nation and certain places around the world, and one of the things that I, I really love is just to be with God's people and to worship with God's people. To participate in what God is doing. So it's an honor to be here with you. I would like us to turn our Bibles today to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians in chapter 5. I'm going to deal with uh, the, uh, the subject of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to look at some things that I know as Pentecostals, as Spirit filled believers, uh, we deal with many times the initial uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit. And of course, that is uh, something that needs to be dealt with, something that we as believers must experience and desire to experience. Uh, there is a second subsequent work uh, of the Holy Spirit for the believer, uh, and that is the baptism with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. We see in several places, four or five places, uh, at least several places in the book of Acts where uh, this uh, took place, the filling, infilling, initial filling, baptism with the Holy Spirit, and at least three or four of those, I believe three of those places, it makes reference to the evidence of speaking with other tongues, one that says speaking with tongues and prophesying. So this is a valid uh, a valid indicator, evidence, if you will, uh, of being baptized with the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, that we should desire as believers to experience. And we're going to give opportunity for anyone at the end of this service to, uh, uh, to enter into that if you, if you so desire, if you want it uh, by faith. But what I really want to focus on here today is other evidences that are really lasting fruit or what would be evidences in the everyday life of the believer, evidences of living a spirit-filled, spirit-controlled life. And the importance of it in our everyday lives, the importance of it beyond a prayer language, the importance of it beyond having power to be able to witness and be able to, uh, to preach and, and, and teach or sing or uh, whatever you may be called to do, the infilling and living a spirit-filled life has far greater implications 
in the life of the believer that go beyond even those things. Go beyond gifts, go beyond tongues, go beyond uh, ministry, service, power to do these things as wonderful as that is. And yes, he will empower you uh, to do these things, to do what you, what you are called to do. He will empower you for service. Yes, he will. But I think that there are other areas of our lives that I feel personally, this is my opinion, that are even more important as it regards the infilling of the Spirit and walking in the fullness of God's Spirit. So I want to read some passages here in Ephesians uh, chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to begin in, uh, in verse 8. All right. Ephesians chapter 5. I want to begin in verse 8. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul said, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. If you're claiming to be a child of light, let's walk as one. Amen. 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 There should be some fruit there. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. But whatsoever does make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. You know, that message is not just to the lost, that's to the church. Yes, amen. Awake thou that sleepest. Many believers are sleeping. Come on. We're spiritually sleeping. We're not really walking in what God has given and what God has provided. We are spiritually speaking. So that message is to us as believers. Awake, thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Then he says this in verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, in verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. He's exhorting believers here, all right? He is exhorting believers to continue to, and I'll say this, believers that have had the initial experience of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. He is exhorting them, really commanding them, to continue. In the original language, it means this, be being filled, meaning to be continually filled, live a lifestyle of being full of God's Spirit. It also means this, to be controlled moment by moment by the Spirit of God. You see, we as believers, we can live a life before the Lord where we are moment by moment controlled by God's Spirit, living a consistent, Spirit-filled, Spirit-controlled life. That should be the norm for the Christian. Amen. You see, what I see in the modern church today is that we are dependent upon experiences and quickenings of God's Spirit. We go to church so that we can have a worship experience. I'm somewhat alarmed by some of the worship that I see in many churches. It's as if they're worshiping their worship. It's as if they are, they're looking for, and I hear this phrase all the time, they're looking for an encounter. All right? I want an encounter too. But the reality is what God desires for us is that we would perpetually encounter the reality of Jesus Christ in our lives. Yes. That we would not need to come to a church service and have a worship 
experience or worship encounter, but we would live in the realm of God's Spirit by faith in His redemption plan. Amen. You see, it is through repentance and self-denial and faith in the finished work of Calvary that we can live in a perpetual encounter with the Lord. Amen. And you won't have to have an experience to prop you up all of the time. Now, I believe in coming to an altar and getting blessed. I believe in anointed worship that will uh, bring you to a place where there is a corporate worship and a corporate sense uh, of the presence of God. But you cannot live by those things. You cannot depend upon those things to get you through your everyday life. Amen. You see, because you're not always in that atmosphere. You're not always in this atmosphere that you're in right now. The reality is, what's it like when you're at home and you're alone? Come on. What's it like when you are at your workplace? What's it like all the other uh, 20, you know, three hours or whatever, 22 hours on any given day, Sunday or Wednesday, that you're not in church, and then 24 hours the other days. What is it like? What is your walk like? What are you experiencing in the Lord? You see, God desires that we walk in a perpetual lifestyle of being filled with God's Spirit, being full all of the time. Amen. You know, we as preachers, many times we we have altar calls for this. This this thing right here called a refill. We all do it. I've done it before. And it's, there's, there's some validity to it. However, let me just say this. I don't believe that that is the perfect will of God for you to need a refilling at all. How can you have need a refilling if you are full? Come on. If you are perpetually full the way you should be, amen, Amen. by living your life in Christ, by faith in the cross, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, if you are full, how can you fill more, a cup that is totally full, how can you fill it anymore? The reason why we need refillings is because we lose what we've had. We lose what we had initially, and, and therefore, the best that we can do is come to an altar and have another experience. And there's nothing wrong with that. I do it. I have altar calls, and, and I believe the Lord is saying, well, if you're not going to stay full, I guess we'll, you know, we'll give you the second best thing, and uh, go ahead and get your refilling. And then in another few days, you're probably going to need another refilling, because you're not living the way you should be, walking in the faith, the faith of Christ, the faith of the Son of God. You're not surrendered to Calvary. You're not denying yourself and taking up the cross and following going after him so I guess we'll just have to keep getting you refilled come on but I'm here to tell you that that's not God's perfect will for you God's perfect will for you is what Paul said here be being filled be controlled perpetually moment by moment by the spirit of God amen that's the will of God for you and let me tell you if you are not living that kind of a life you will not be able to be the Christian that God has called you to be. Come on, brother. Yeah. You see, it's easy to come into church a couple hours a week. Yeah. It's easy for me. I can come in here. I can shake a few hands, smile, praise God, hallelujah. Stand up here and preach for 40, 45 minutes, and then I'm out the door. But what's my life like the rest of the time? What's my life like when I'm by myself, when I'm with my wife in my home, with my family? How am I then? That's really where the rubber meets the road. Right, right. That's where you need, my friend, listen. Yes. You need the power of God's Spirit Hallelujah. really in a greater way yeah. when you're at home with your family, with your spouse. You need the power of God. Amen. 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 
It's easy. I'm called to preach. I'm anointed to preach. I can get up here under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Like I said, I can do this for 40, 45 minutes. But the hard part is when I go home and I live with my wife and she does something that I don't like. How do I act and how do I respond? Come on. Come on. That's where the rubber meets wow. the road, folks. Yes. That's where the spirit-filled life is really. You know, there's a something that we say here, and I might make some people mad, that I don't necessarily anymore, and I've said it myself many times, I don't necessarily agree with, and it's this, that the baptism with the Holy Spirit is primarily for service. Come on. I don't necessarily agree with that. Yes, it does enhance your service, your preaching, whatever you're called to do. And even if you're called to be in business or whatever, that's your service. Right. God will enhance that and God will help you with that. Right, right. But this is my feeling personally. If I was going to use the word primarily, I would say the fullness, the baptism, and that's what it is. The fullness of God's Spirit in the life of the believer is primarily for you to be a Christian. Come on. Amen. Amen. Primarily for you to live out the Christian life the way that God has ordained it and laid out in His Word for you to live it out. That's when you need the power of God yes. the most. Amen. 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 So Paul is exhorting these believers to continually be filled. I want to look at the previous verses here just a little bit, these statements here. They're very important that we understand what they mean. In verse 15, when he says, see that you walk circumspectly, all right? It's important because if you don't understand how to stay full of God's Spirit, you won't be able to. Mm, that's right. You don't stay full of God's Spirit by praying for three hours a day. Come on. Well, that would do you good to pray three hours a day. You can do it. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to stay full of God's Spirit. You don't stay full of God's Spirit by attending every church service, and you should. Amen? Amen. You should want to uh, assemble together with God's people. There is only one way, listen to me, that you can perpetually stay full of God's Spirit and be brought under the control of the Spirit of God. And Paul uses the word here, the expression, to walk circumspectly. Now, what does that mean? It means literally to walk in an upright manner, mm. to walk a straight path, to walk. Really what it means is to order your behavior, listen, in the way that God has ordained for you to order your behavior. Yeah. In other words, how he has ordained you to walk. How has he ordained you to walk this Christian walk? <clears throat> well, it's found in Romans 8 and 2, according to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. In other words, what he is saying is live your life, walk according to the new covenant. Yes. Walk according to faith in what your heavenly Father has provided in Christ. He's provided Jesus, the Son of God, the cross of Calvary, the blood that He shed. That is the way that you are to walk. Yes. A perpetual faith in that, a dependence and a trust in that finished work. Yes. You see, the problem with us is that we don't surrender to it the way mm. we should. We all say, yeah, the cross, the cross. Come on, bro. Jesus. What He did on the cross. But let me ask you, are you surrendered to it? Mm. Have you yielded yourself to what God has provided? Paul said in Romans chapter 6, yield yourselves. Oh, yield yourselves to Him as servants. Amen? Amen. Yield yourself, really what he is saying. Yield yourself to what Christ has provided on the cross. He said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves to God a living sacrifice. Amen. So we must present ourselves, surrender, submit, Yield yeah. to what God has provided in Christ. Amen. And to the degree that you do that, by putting your faith in that, to the degree will the Holy Spirit now fill you and control you. 
That's what we want. We want the control of God's Spirit in our life. You know, I don't think we realize that the Holy Spirit will only move on our behalf and only work on our behalf to the degree that we are living our lives by faith in Christ. Amen. It's a legal work. Amen. This is a legal thing. In other words, the Holy Spirit will not be able to he will not be able to do in your life what He desires to do unless you go the way that the Heavenly Father has lined out in His Word. The Holy Spirit's hands are tied unless you go the way that God has provided. Come on, brother. And the way is Calvary. The way is faith in the blood. And when you do that, my friend, listen to me. When you submit to that, when you surrender to that, when you yield to that, the Holy Ghost will be all over you. Come on. Yeah. Amen. Does anybody want the Holy Ghost all over you? Maybe Amen. you don't, because that means conviction too. Yes. That means Him changing some things Amen. in your life. That means Him doing some things that may be areas that need to be adjusted in your life. But when you go the way and you live according to the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, that opens the door, my friend, for the Holy Spirit to now have His way in your life. Amen. 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 Oh, I got one excited about that. <laughs> Do we want to live a spirit-filled, yes. spirit-controlled life? Yes. We can only do it by faith Amen. in the new covenant, in what God has provided in Christ. This is, like I said, a legal thing. Yes. God will not violate His Word. He will not violate His laws. The law that He created, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, it's an operating and a governing principle God will operate that way. He will not operate any other way. Amen. If you're trying to be led by the Spirit any other way, if you're trying to conjure it up, you're trying to pray it up, you're trying to worship it up, or whatever you're trying to do to get the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm concerned about people that pray to the Holy Spirit. Come on. We're not to pray to the Holy Spirit. That's right. You know, you can pray to Him all day long, but He is only going to move in your life to the degree that Christ is lifted up in your life. Amen. Jesus said of the Spirit that He has come to teach you all things concerning me. That's the purpose of the Spirit. And the more that Christ is lifted up, the more the Holy Spirit will be there to work and to move in your heart and in your life. He's there. He is here to glorify Him. Yes. Amen? He's here to glorify Him. So we ought to walk circumspectly in a straight manner. The way that God has laid out in His Word according to the New Covenant, not as fools, but as wise. You see, the wise person walks the way that God has laid out in His Word. If you walk as a fool, that means you're walking according to man's ways. You're caught walking according to the flesh. God's way is Calvary. Wisdom, the wisdom of the cross. Paul lays out in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 the wisdom of God that is revealed in what Christ did on the cross. Amen. That is the epitome of wisdom, what Christ did on Calvary's cross. And then he would say this, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We must be very careful how we walk this walk, especially in the day that we live in. The days are evil. Yes. That's right. That's why it's important even more so today that we align ourselves with the new covenant, with the way that God has laid out in his word. It's more important today than it's ever been redeeming the time because the days are evil. Listen, if you're not walking the way that God laid out in his word, evil just might swallow you up. Come on, brother. Folks, we live in an evil hour, an evil day. I'm amazed at Christians that are being swept up in the spirit of this world. Yeah. Yes. Being caught up in the spirit of this world because they are not redeeming the time. They're not walking as those who are wise. They're not walking as those who are submitted to the way that God has laid out in His Word according to the new covenant. 
And then he says, Be ye, verse 17, not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, when Paul is talking here about the will of the Lord, he's not talking about your calling or your ministry. Come on. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the will of God as it pertains to how to walk with God. <laughs> Remember Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul prayed this prayer for these believers. He prayed that they would be filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, or they would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding is how we walk with God, how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. He's praying again that they would, they would have that wisdom. They would be filled with the knowledge of God's will as it pertains to how to walk with God. Amen. 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 How to walk with God according to faith. Faith in the finished work of Calvary. So the will of God that Paul is talking about here, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is as it pertains to you and how you walk with God by faith in Calvary's cross. Say, brother, you talk about the cross a lot. <laughs> well, I talk about the cross a lot because that's what Christianity is. Come on, brother. Yeah. Yeah. It's Christ and what he did on the cross. That's right. And if we get that right, then everything else will be right. Amen. We've got to get that right first. And that's why Paul talked about it all of the time. So he's talking about ordering our behavior. Listen, ordering our footsteps, living our life the way that he has ordained it in his word and the way that he has ordained it in his word is a surrendered yielded faith in the finished work of Calvary Amen. that's how you live the Christian life that's Christianity Christianity isn't do goodism it's not you just trying to be good and do good come on that's not what Christianity is it's not you trying to obey outward laws Christianity is you positioning yourself and submitting yourself in such a way that Christ lives in you. Yes. The hope of glory. And the more that He lives in you, I said it yesterday, the more He lives in you, the more He is glorified yes. in this earth. Amen. That's Christianity. If you don't want that, then just go ahead and be a good Mormon. Come on. Come Mormons on. are some of the most disciplined religious people. Uh, I mean, they doctor up their flesh, man. They're, you know, family-oriented people. I mean, you know, as far as carnality, they got it going on. Come on. As far as religion, but they don't have a relationship. That's right. True Bible Christianity is us allowing ourselves through repentance, denial of self, and surrender, allowing Christ to live in us. And through us. Amen. And if we'll do that, then the Holy Spirit will have his way in our lives. Paul says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. In, listen, anything that controls you Amen. is sin. That's right. Anything other than the Holy Spirit. Yes, it can be wine. It can be drugs. It can be lust. It can be the spirit of the world. It can be money. It can be your business. Anything that controls you is displeasing to the Lord other than the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's the idea there. Don't be controlled by anything. Be controlled by the Spirit of God. That is the will of God. Amen. So now what we see here after this, and I can't get into great detail because it covers many, uh, many passages here. We'll just briefly go over some of these things but what we see now is the fruit follow me what we see now after verse 18 we see the fruit of a spirit controlled life and I'm going to ask you to measure yourself to examine yourself as we briefly travel through some of these things that are fruit of a spirit controlled life the first thing that Paul says in verse 19, he says, speaking to yourselves 
in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, what that is, is this. As a result of being spirit-controlled, there will be a corporate worship in the body of Christ. That's what he means, speaking to yourselves corporately in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, meaning this, that when you are full of the Holy Ghost, my friend, there's going to be a praise in your heart. Amen. I'm amazed when I go to churches and I see this many people just standing there like this, hands in their pockets. Uh -oh. yeah. Yeah. Just looking around. You know, when the, when the music is anointed and the worship is there and they're just, they're distracted. There's no praise on their lips. Mm. We are to open our mouths when the opportunity. Let me Come tell you, on. when you're full of the Holy Ghost, you want to do that. It's not ours. I can't help but when I come into the house of God. I cannot help but open my mouth and lift up my hands and praise my God. Hallelujah. Yes. Even when there's songs that I really don't care for and don't think of that enough, I'm going to praise God anyhow. Amen. I'll lift up my hands and hallelujah. Praise God. I used to get all frustrated when there'd be songs. I thought, man, that's not annoying at this. <laughs> and I would get, but now I just realized, man, I'm just going to lift up my hands. Yes. I'm going to praise God anyhow. Praise God. Amen. Amen. But there should be, for the spirit-filled believer, a praise on your lips corporately. And then making melody in your heart to the Lord is when you're by yourself. Yes. Yeah. What's going on in your, in your spirit, mm. in your heart, when you're by yourself? When you're driving down the road, it doesn't mean always mouthing songs, but there's, there's something you feel, the the uh, the stirring, that river, amen? Yes. That fountain of living water. You're full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's bubbling over. I find myself many times, and I'm not saying that I have arrived, but I'm growing in my understanding of this and growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. But more and more, I find when I'm by myself and I'm driving down the road, there's a praise on my lips. Praise, amen. amen. I'm speaking in tongues. I think I mentioned it yesterday that, uh, you know, I'll be watching a ball game or a golf match or something like that. And many times, you know, I'll just be looking at the TV, but I'll be praying in the spirit. Amen. Not really watching it, just looking at it. I'm not, you know, certainly not against watching, you know, some sports or whatever. But the idea is this, that there should be a lifestyle of praise and worship for the spirit-filled believer. That's fruit. That's fruit of being filled. All right. Now it gets serious here. Uh, in, in verse uh, 20, well, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that goes along actually with verse uh, 19. Thankfulness, amen. I'll be thankful for the things that the Lord has given to us, amen? And ultimately what he's referring to is those promises that have been given to us. I, I spoke yesterday of, of the benefits and the promises of Calvary. Yeah. Are we thankful? Is, or do we have a thankful heart for those promises and those benefits, what Christ wrought for us amen. on Calvary's cross? All right? Uh, but then this is where it gets serious in verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another... In the fear of God. Amen. That is a fruit of a spirit-filled life. Praise God. Many of us don't really understand what submission is. Submission is not you being a doormat and just doing everything that someone tells you to do. That's, That's right. Submission. But I read one commentator, and I think this summarized submission better than any other that I read. He said this. Submission is loving and serving one another. Praise God. Amen. That's you it. will know, my friend, when you are living a spirit-filled life, when you don't have a problem loving your brother and sister and serving them. Yes. What would it be in church if everyone loved one another and everyone served one another? Praise God. I'm just here to serve you. I'm here to meet your need. What, what do you need? You want me to pray with you? You want me to, do you have a need? I'm here to exhibit my love for you by serving you. That's a fruit of a spirit-filled life. Because listen, my friend, you cannot do that without the Holy Ghost. You know why? Because we selfish. 
That's right. We selfish. In us is envy. These are works of the flesh. Envy and strife and jealousy. Come on. I want mine. You know. Come on, brother. You meet my needs. I'm not here to help you. I'm. I, I, you help me. Mm. That's the flesh. That's not the spirit of God. But the spirit-filled believer is willing to lay their life down and love and serve one another, That's submitting right. to one another in the fear of God. And then he gets into where the rubber really meets it. So he deals with the church life. Amen. Amen. Submitting to one another. Now we're really where the rubber meets the road. In verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Praise God. The evidence for you wives of being full of God's spirit, are you submitted to your husband? Well, you don't know my husband. He's a rascal. <laughs> he doesn't do everything right. Of course he doesn't do everything right. He's human. Yes. But as you submit to the Lord, your responsibility now as a spirit-filled woman of God is you submit to the leadership of your... God has an order in the household. That's right. Amen. He has an order, a government in the household. And your responsibility not to be a doormat. Remember what, what uh, submitting is. You are there to love your husband and to serve him. But you see, in reality, the husband is to do the same thing to the wife because the previous command, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are to submit to one another. Amen. So there is still, the husband is to love and to serve his wife, but as it regards that government and that hierarchy or the uh, how it works in the family, the wife has a special, unique responsibility to honor the man of God, to love him, and to serve him. All right, then he goes on. I'm not going to read all of this, but uh, I'll just jump down a couple of verses here in verse 25. Now, the responsibility of the husband. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Praise God. Husband, let's, let's examine ourselves here. Are we loving our lives the way that Christ loved the church and laid his life down for her? Are you cherishing that woman? Are you on a daily basis, a daily practical basis, are you laying your life down for that woman that God gave you? Listen, man of God, the only way you can do it is to be spirit-filled. You know why? Because we selfish. Come on, man. <clears throat> you meet my needs. Come on. I'm the head of this household. But a true man of God, and you know, that laying, uh, laying our life down, you know, just about every man in here would say, well, I'd take a bullet for my wife. Well, that, that's easy. <laughs> that would be the easy thing. Come on. The hard thing is on a day-by-day -day basis, you saying, honey, how can I make this better for you? What can I do for you today? Do you want, you want me to do the dishes? I'll do the dishes. I'll go ahead and vacuum that floor. You see that she's had a long day, a hard day. That's laying your life down, my friend. Yes, yes. You being there for her and humbling yourself and cherishing her and, and, and allowing her to be what she is can be and should be as a woman of God, not oppressing her, but loving her the way that Christ loved us and laid his life down for us. Amen. Amen. That's a pretty hefty responsibility, isn't it? But that's a fruit of being spirit-filled. We need to examine ourselves. Are we laying our lives down for our wives on a daily basis? Paul gets the deal. He kind of goes into a dissertation here on the church and the relationship with the, the church, the bride of Christ, so on and so forth. Uh, nevertheless, verse uh, 20, uh, 23, he says, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. All right, Spirit-filled believers. Then he gets into children. We're just going to briefly go over the children. Uh, the responsibility of children to their parents, spirit-filled children should honor their parents. Uh, parents should uh, treat their, their children uh, properly. 
Uh, let's, we'll read a little bit of the children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou may live long on the earth. So you see here a great benefit for you children honoring your parents. Yeah, it's pretty serious. And you can only really do that, do that perpetually, continually, if you're full of God's Spirit. You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath and bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That's a fruit of a Spirit-filled, Spirit-controlled life. And he gets into servants and masters, slaves and masters. Of course, we don't deal with that today. Uh, but how about employee-employer relationships? How are you on the job? You see, this is where the rubber beats the road. We're talking about our families, our everyday family life, all right? Spirit-filled life with first the church, then the family, with uh, husband, wives, children. And now where we spend a lot of our time, unless we're retired, at the job, employees and employers. Amen. How are we acting as employees? Are we, as Paul says here, uh, not with uh, servants be obedient to them, verse 5, that are masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free, and you masters do the same things, Unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is the respect of persons with him. So the idea here, as an employee, are you doing your job even when the boss isn't looking? Come on. Because you're spirit-filled and you're submitted to the Lord. Are you doing your job? Because you are a child of God. And you employers, are you treating your employees with respect? Amen. Are you honoring them, respecting them? Fruit of the spirit-filled life, where the rubber really meets the road in our everyday lives. So we see that the living the spirit-filled life has far more, far greater implications than just anointed power to preach, to teach, service, so on and so forth. Amen but it should be carried over in our everyday lives. Amen. I want to look at something else briefly here. Not only is it significant as it pertains to our everyday lives, but I want to look at something in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. I'll try to be as brief as I can here. Matthew chapter 24, of course, Jesus giving the signs of the end of the times. In the latter part of uh, uh, Matthew chapter 24, you know, he's warning that God knows the day and the hour. He, he warns them. Uh, verse 42 of chapter 24, watch therefore, for you don't know at what hour your Lord does come. Uh, in verse 44, therefore be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. It's important that we're ready, amen? Amen. We're ready. Jesus could come back at any moment. He could come back at any moment. You know, I think we lose sight of that as believers. We lose that reality that the Son of God could come back at any moment. We get complacent. We get comfortable. Uh, but that the trump of God could sound not. And the question is, are we ready? Then he gives the, uh, uh, the parable of the foolish, wise and foolish virgins in chapter 25. And he says this, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wives took oil in their vessels with their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go ye out to meet him. And all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, 
for our lamps are gone out. I wonder how many believers their lamps have gone out. Our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, say, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they uh, that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Truly I say unto you, what, what a horrible thing to hear from the Lord, I know you not. I know you not. Watch, therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Very briefly here, I want to I want to unpack something here. I've heard a lot of read after a lot of commentators. Some believe that the five foolish virgins that they were never saved. I don't agree with that. They were. Amen. Uh, because if you look at verse nine, it says, uh, or verse eight, he says, and the foolish said unto the wise, "Give us of your oil for our lamps." Come on are gone out. So that tells us that at one time their lamps were burning. Come on. At one time their lamps were full of oil. They were full of the Holy Ghost. They started out right, man. They were saved, born again, on fire for God, came to an altar, if you will, got baptized with the Holy Spirit, and maybe for a season, a period of time, they walked with God, but then something happened. Let me just uh, submit this thought as to what may have, have happened to these five foolish virgins. Could it be that they began to take their eyes off of Christ? That's right. They began to no longer place their faith in the finished work of Calvary. They started depending upon themselves. Or maybe they were putting their faith in their church, in their preacher, in their denomination. Come on. Maybe they were putting their faith, and it's a gradual thing. Usually it's the way the devil works. Maybe they were putting their faith in the latest gimmick, fad, scheme that comes down the pipe of the church. 40 days of purpose or 10 days of this and 21 days of that. And little by little, what can happen, and this is the deceit of the enemy, is we start putting our faith in other things. And before you know it, we no longer have our faith in what it is supposed to be. The crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, ascended Lord of glory. And then we find ourselves going through the motions. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I know how to do it. I'll come to church and just do what I do all the time. Help us, Lord. Put on a little smile. Shake a couple hands. Maybe enter into worship for a few moments. Feel something. You can be unsaved and feel something. Yeah. Come on. Go through the motions. Of Christianity, even thinking that you're still okay, even thinking that you're still filled with the Spirit, even thinking that you're still born again. And no, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual thing. I don't believe it's easy for a believer who's been on fire for God to lose their faith, but it's possible. You can do it. And what I believe happened to these Foolish virgins is what I just described. Little by little, they took their faith, their trust, their dependence away from the place that it needed to be. And that's Christ and His finished work. And little by little, they found themselves just going through the motions. Christianity. Kind of sounds like Samson, you know, when he... Uh, shook himself that one time, that last time, and thought that he still had the power. But because his hair had been cut, he didn't have the power anymore. How many Christians, it's the same way. We think we still got it, but the power has left us. Because we're no longer submitted to the way that God has laid out in His Word. So I don't believe that you have to be baptized with the Holy Spirit to make it to heaven. I don't believe that. But what I do believe can happen if you're not living a spirit-filled life is little by little as 
sin can begin to uh, overtake you. Sin can begin to have dominion over you. Because if you're not controlled by God's Spirit, that's what will happen. You'll find yourself in bondage. And then what happens is you get discouraged. And you say, I can't live this life. I can't serve God the way that I know that I need to serve God. And you know what? I'm just going to give up because I can't do it anymore. Because you really can't be what God has called you to be without the power of God's Spirit operating within your life. And the only way the power of God's Spirit can be operating in your life on a perpetual basis is for you to have a focused, Faith, surrender, and yes. the finished yes. work oh, of Calvary. Right, yes. And then you don't have to worry about it, my friend. Why don't we just put ourselves in a position where we don't have to worry about it when the trump of God sounds? We know that we know that we know that we are going to be with the Lord throughout eternity because we are living a spirit-filled, spirit-controlled life because our faith is right in the finished world. Amen. 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 So, the Spirit-filled life goes far beyond tongues, far beyond having an experience. It should affect our everyday lives here and now, and it could affect where we spend eternity. That's how important that it is. That's how important that it is. Let's follow our heads. Maya, if you could come up here. Father, we thank you. Thank you for what you've given to us. Thank you for what you've provided for us in your son. Thank you that we have the great privilege of being the temple of God and the spirit of God dwelling within us. What a privilege, what an honor. And Lord, I just pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that they will recognize the seriousness of this subject, the seriousness of the matter, the seriousness of the time in which we are living, Lord. That if there was ever a time that we needed to be spirit-filled, spirit-controlled, that time is today. So, Lord, we ask for the convicting power of your spirit. We rebuke and resist condemnation. We accept and we welcome conviction the conviction of your spirit. If we're not living a spirit-filled life, may the Holy Spirit convict us and bring us to the place of repentance. Bring us to the place where we will desire and submit to the way that you have laid out in your word and how to serve you by faith in the finished work of Calvary. Pray that you will move upon the hearts of your people. Help them to realize their need. Help us all to realize our need. And Lord, we'll ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask you to stand if you can.